This research film will explore the collision between art and fashion, and how different creatives merge the two together through different concepts and styles. I will also argue that the creation of wearable art utilises the creativity of designers and artists, which is often translated through adopting unique concepts and using materials that aren't commonly thought of as fashion related. These unique concepts are often communicated through upcycling various products and materials, thus showing that part of the definition of wearable art is sustainability. Fashion is a popular aesthetic expression at a particular period and place in a specific context, especially in clothing, footwear, lifestyle, accessories, makeup, hairstyle and body proportions. Art is the making of objects, images, music, etc. that are beautiful or express feelings. Mixing these two together creates the idea of wearable art, clothing of a consciously artistic and unconventional design. This leads me on to talk about Nicole McLaughlin, the New York-based designer who changed her hobby into a career in 2018 when she began posting her projects on Instagram and gained a large following in a short time. McLaughlin's technique could be described as a stylish aesthetic expression of bricolage, a construction made of whatever materials are at hand, something created from a variety of available things. The recurring theme behind McLaughlin's work is the idea of upcycling and sustainability. To upcycle something is to treat an item that has already been used in such a way that you can make something of greater quality or value than the original item. And being sustainable is to use natural products and energy in a way that doesn't harm the environment and the ability for a product to continue being usable for a long time. She takes items and transforms them into fashion accessories and garments, and she also takes fashion accessories and garments and turns them into pieces of art. It's said on her website that this unexpected translation of materials allows her to uniquely highlight the message of sustainability, a key element to her success in changing the perception around waste and sustainable design. McLaughlin holds workshops to show people the endless possibilities there are with everyday objects and how people can think outside the box and use their imagination to turn one thing into another by ignoring the restrictions and typical rules. McLaughlin has done many projects for different companies, including Fila, Prada, Chinatown Market, Allbirds, Crocs and Reebok. McLaughlin likes to choose brands which evoke feelings of nostalgia to herself and the viewer so she chooses brands which mean something to her. This is where the definition of art fits into her work. For example, she released a 17-piece bespoke collection made of upcycled products in a collaboration with Reebok, a company which she landed an internship with during her college years. McLaughlin told High Snobiety, I have such a strong love for Reebok's archive and vintage product. I wanted this collection to highlight their incredible history while combining my own design ethos of upcycling and remaking. For me personally, art which evokes most feeling is art involving humour and playfulness. Nicole McLaughlin as a brand demonstrates perfectly the idea of playful, wearable art and sustainability having a correlation. And through my research I found that wearable art often involves a tongue-in-cheek sentiment, and her ethos backs up my argument well. Christopher Kane is the London-based fashion label founded by Christopher Kane and his sister Tammy Kane in 2006 when Kane won awards for his Central St Martin's MA show. A recurring theme that features in Kane's collections is sex, and something that makes him stand out from other designers is his ability to fuse provocative eroticism with elegance and style. Kane tells Business of Fashion how he has always been fascinated with the naked human body since he was a young boy. At school, he would get in trouble in his art classes for choosing to draw taboo body parts as his subject, but he didn't see the problem of being interested in the human body's natural form. He has carried his love and openness for nudity and sexuality through into his creative career, where he marries his passion for art with his skill for design, and that's what results in the consideration that his designs are wearable art. In relation to the correlation between art, fashion and sustainability is Kane's Spring-Summer 2020 collection, based around the concept of eco-sexuality, a radical form of activism based around nature fetishism, the idea of the earth as a lover. Christopher Kane as a brand abide by the Kering Group standards, the global luxury group whom which Kane became independent from in 2018. Kering holds strict standards around sustainability and ethicality, and Kane follows suit, holding a 4 out of 5 star rating regarding their low impact on the environment. After carrying out some research about whether Kane's spring-summer 2020 collection specifically is sustainable and low impact, it was hard to find a definitive answer, which is slightly ironic considering the theme of the collection. However, 
Sophie Wilson from ID Magazine writes that Kane claims that this show was not designed to act as a comment on the climate crisis. Sustainability means to not harm the environment, but to look after it and nurture it. This definition correlates to the definition of ecosexuality, just minus the sexual element. The definitions of both these terms involves the idea of loving the earth and the nature that surrounds us. So although Christopher Kane has not been abundantly clear on what the eco-credentials are in this collection, I believe it fits into my argument that playful wearable art is often presented through the notion of sustainability. Kelly Grovier brought up a very interesting point about the result of the collaboration between art and fashion in her article called When Fashion and Art Collide, which was published in the BBC's Design section. In this article, Grovier references the 1937 collaboration between Salvador Dali, the Spanish surrealist artist, and Elsa Schiaparelli, the Italian fashion designer, where which they created a long silk dress with the print of a lobster imprinted along the front from the waist down. In this article, Grovier spoke of the difficulties artists and designers face when working together due to their differences in creative aspirations. Grovier wrote, What motivates artists is the desire to create an object or image that is timeless, a work that transcends trend. Designers, on the other hand, rely for their very livelihood on the mutability of taste. By definition, their work is seasonal, if not disposable, and depends upon the constant flux of what is considered fashionable. Salvador Dali was born in 1904 and was a troubled child whose parents consistently compared to his dead brother, whom Dali believed was killed by his own father due to a blow to the head which resulted in meningitis. His difficult childhood would cause him to deliberately provoke his parents with a long list of troubling and aggressive behaviours. For example, deliberate bedwetting, prolonged screaming and physical aggression towards other children. In the book The Life and Masterworks of Salvador Dali, the author, Eric Shanes, writes of his belief that eventually both Dali's innate rebelliousness and exhibitionism would serve him in good stead artistically. Elsa Schiaparelli was born in 1890 in Rome, Italy. Schiaparelli is known for her artist collaborations and outlandish designs and is specifically remembered highly for her collaboration with Salvador Dali, among other surrealist artists in the 1930s. In Victoria R. Pass's article, Schiaparelli's Dark Circus, Pars makes a statement that Schiaparelli is often seen as simply the translator of Dali's work into fashion. However, Pars disagrees and believes that the Italian fashion designer has always taken to dark inspirations, and not just in the 1930s in response to the impending threat of totalitarianism. Much like Dali, Schiaparelli was exceedingly rebellious in her younger years. As Rosie Lesso states in her article, Elsa Schiaparelli, The Shock of the New, Schiaparelli would run away for days, as well as stuffing flower seeds into her ears, nose and mouth to become more beautiful, and opening a jar of fleas during a lavish dinner party. And as a young adult, she was sent to a convent due to publishing a book of erotic poetry which shocked her parents. Her rebellious nature during her youth is likely what brought her successes because she took risks with her designs and didn't follow the crowds. As young people, Dali and Schiaparelli had many comparable characteristics, which would have shaped them in the future. These similarities must have been what brought the two creatives together and allowed them to produce such harmonious work. Going back to the point made by Grovier about the opposing intentions of artists and fashion designers, I feel as though the fact that artists make creations that stand the test of time links to the idea of sustainability, creating something that will sustain its objective beauty. By taking this sustainable component of art and merging it with fashion is a resourceful way for Schiaparelli to make her designs timeless and, in my opinion, sustainable. I would argue that in simple terms there are three different ways of communicating the collaboration between art and fashion design, so I've put them into three categories. Artwork simply being printed onto a garment, the design and structural aspect of a garment being the art, and the way in which a fashion show is exhibited being the art. So an example of artwork being printed onto a fashion garment is a dress from Dior's Spring-Summer 2007 Couture Collection, where John Galliano printed the 1830 Japanese painting The Great Wave of Kanagawa by Katsushika Hokusai onto the bottom of the beautifully structured gown. Similarly to what I mentioned previously with Dali and Schiaparelli's collaboration, this dress is sustainable in terms of beauty. 
By incorporating one of the most famous and popular paintings of all time, the Great Wave of Kanagawa, this dress will sustain its charm. It transcends trend. An example of wearable art being based on the shape and structure of a garment is the designs of Iris Van Herpen, most memorably her hypnosis collection. Van Herpen's collections base themselves around the notion of the intertwinement between the mind and body, the mercurial dance in which the body and mind intersect. Being a couture designer, Van Herpen's collections are already more eco-friendly. She tells Pa Emily Chan from Vogue Paris, you're not creating in the hope that somebody will wear it, you're creating on demand. In relation to my argument that wearable art is often combined with sustainability, Van Herpen's collections fit well. She works with scientists and architects to develop modern eco-conscious fabrics and explains that within couture there is time and space to develop materials. Understandably, this extra element of research and innovation adds a lot more challenges during her creative process and admits to Chan that using fabrics with no chemicals can result in less durability. The fact that Van Herpen knows that using more eco-friendly fabrics makes her work harder to produce, yet still chooses to take the side of the environment says a lot about her as a designer and also in part shows the correlation between wearable art and sustainability. An example of fashion shows incorporating performance art is Desigual's Love Different 2020 collection. It was showcased as less of a catwalk, but more of a performance, thanks to their collaboration with the photographer and artistic director, Carlota Guerrero. The ironic thing about this fashion show is that all of the models end up undressing themselves. In my opinion, this irony, along with the theatrical nature of the show, is what makes it art. The playful yet sensual nature of the performance makes it memorable to the audience. And in other words, it sustains its individualism from other catwalk shows. On a side note, Desigual's Love the World collection gives me real eco-sexual vibes. In their e-commerce shots, the models are draped across tree branches and doing topless cartwheels among nature. I thought this link to Christopher Kane's Spring Summer 2020 collection was interesting to note, as they hold similar links to the love of the earth and artistic designs. The collection also uses clouded sky-like textiles, much like some of Kane's pieces do. Desigual is known for their environmentally friendly beliefs and claim that the best way to feel good is to do good. They are very open in sharing their sustainability statistics on their website and released a 100% sustainable collection with EcoAlf last year. So, in conclusion, Desigual mixes their sustainability and ethicality with their artistic direction, thus backing up my argument that often, wearable art is related to sustainability. I interviewed a good friend of mine, Natalie Metcalf, who began her sustainable wearable art brand called Scatty Natty Clothing last year. The inspiration to begin her brand came about while at a festival, when one of her handmade jackets received attention and interest. Natalie describes her brand style as wearable art and says she likes to use clothing as a way to express her creativity. Her aim is to create statement pieces that make her customers feel as though they're wearing artwork. So I'd say when I was in school, I used to love mixing different materials and different artwork and I feel like through Scatty Natty I've learned how to do that because I'd always experiment with different fabrics, different materials to make something just like super colourful and creative so I think I've used my love for art and my love for fashion and kind of created one big thing. Yeah. Because I grew up in Saudi Arabia, mm. we didn't have any, like, you couldn't find anything that wasn't mainstream. Everything was, like, was. high street, yeah. And you wouldn't get anything that was unique or, like, handmade mm. because, yeah, that just wasn't a thing there. Coming to the UK, I realised, like, who I was and I could start experimenting with my fashion. And obviously, in Saudi as well, you had to wear an abaya, which would cover everything you're wearing. Yeah. So there, a big style was, like, what your abaya would look like. Yeah. and. Obviously, like, that wasn't appealing to me. Like, no, Side. see, when I lived in Saudi, I had no idea that I was creative. And in Saudi, the, like, art and the, like, culture is just all very, like, dark, you know, thick, like, heavy clothing and, like, all designer-based. Like, yeah. there's nothing that was actually, like, out there. So in conclusion to my research on Scatty Natty clothing, all designs are physical manifestations of Natalie's creative mind and her expressive nature, which she translates into sustainable, made-to-order coats, hats and bags. 
The use of scrap materials for the patchwork designs reinforced the element of upcycling and low waste in the business, and once again underlines the notion of wearable art and sustainability being intertwined. In reflection of the research accumulated in this video dissertation, I feel that I have provided enough information and resources to back up the argument that wearable art is often communicated through sustainable means. I have presented the facts that wearable art comes in multiple forms and is objective to the viewer, as well as presenting the fact that the notion of sustainability in each of these wearable art cases is present, whether that be through physical or psychological means.